Hi everyone, welcome back to part two. I'm kind of cracking up here looking at uh, some of the screenshots that start the new videos with my face making odd gestures. Um, so a little bit of humor for me anyway. Uh, before we get started on early uh, American portraiture, um, basically portraiture that starts way back in colonial times uh, in the 17th century and then we'll move um, Let's see how far are we going to get here into basically early 19th century. I wanted to take a moment just to kind of recap what we've been doing here and make sure we're all on the same page with what I'm hoping for you to get out of these lectures at a kind of basic level. So we're going to start slow and I'm not going to try to tell you every single thing about every single painting. We're not doing the kind of in-depth analysis that frankly, as the quarter moves along, we will progress towards trying to give you kind of a, um, uh, an entry into art history and an entry into these early, uh, what we've been looking at so far, colonial uh, exploratory artist works that bring back a little bit of information about the new world to Europeans and give you a sense of why they're doing this, um, what the general subjects are, how those subjects are very generally represented and so forth. So I, I've started this lecture before we go into portraiture, just returning again briefly to um, Jacques Lemoyne de Morgue's work that we saw just a few moments ago, René de Laudonnier and Chief Atore at Ribot's Column. And I just, just so this is in front of you, what I'd like you to have gotten out of the first hour of lecture is um, first and foremost that these works of art, these things that we call works of art, paintings and sculptures and so forth, are less representations of actual events or occurrences or objects than they are representations of those events, occurrences and objects filtered through the ideology or assumptions of the artist uh, who is, of course, a product of their own time, that we have to think very carefully about why the subjects and objects are represented in the way that they are. And the way that we determine that or get a kind of sense of why an artist might have represented, first of all, a particular subject, why they would include only parts of that particular subject in their painting, right? What, what is actually included there? Uh, why they, for instance, focus on one particular moment of a larger um, series of historical events, um, and what all of that has to do with what was going on at the time in their world, right? The context. So let's go through this very quickly again. What we have here are, or what we've looked at so far are a series of works of art, either kind of simple paintings in gouache or watercolor or engravings. These are not the kind of large scale, um, very meticulous paintings that you get in the European tradition that are painted in oils and, and fresco and so forth uh, that are produced by artists who by and large were either accompanying various colonial expeditions or exploratory expeditions or uh, we're wanting to, um, in the case of Theodore de, de Bry primarily, wanting to draw upon other artists who had done this in order to meet a need that was out there in Europe around uh, curiosity about images from the New World. Now at a basic level, that's what these are, right? These artists are going, this is a new exploration, a new world, there's a lot of excitement about it. And they are um, producing images so that people back in Europe can see uh, what this new world is all about. After all, not everyone's traveling there yet. So curiosity at the first level. Second level though, of course, is that there is a prevailing spirit in the world of this time to get people to colonize or to explore this new world, right? You want uh, people to go and colonize for various different reasons, right? The Spanish want to go get gold primarily. They're not doing a heck of a lot of early colonizing. Um, the Spanish also want to go, as do the French, to proselytize, right? The Catholics in particular at this time are very interested in converting the natives. But this 
as well uh, meets up with what I think is the major urge, which is we want people to come to the new world to colonize so that we can make use of all of the new natural resources or just simply put wealth that can be attained by exploring and colonizing this new world, right? That's in the background. That's a big idea. We need to go out there and colonize because it will net us something in terms of material wealth. Now, of course, there are also um, people who want to colonize, especially early on on the eastern seaboard coming from England because they are seeking to, um, and it's not just England, of course, France does this as well as we talked about with the Huguenots, to um, seek basically religious asylum, to practice their own religious faith without being censored, without being uh, prejudiced against, sometimes, uh, you know, without being frankly uh, outright killed uh, in some of these nations. So, but even then, let's say you are a, a, a Protestant, a Huguenot that lives in France. It's a largely Catholic society. You want to get out of there so that you can come to the new world. Of course, you want to come to a world that is welcoming, one that is full of bounty, one that gives you the possibility of prosperity, right? And so these pictures play to that. They don't, at least early on, show you any of the pitfalls of coming to the New World. Or if they do, they blame it on another country, right? So we saw Theodore de Bry saying, the world's great, or it could be great, except the Spanish are doing it all wrong. And if you just do it like uh, us Protestants, uh, in particular the English, the natives will welcome you, you won't have these problems, it'll be prosperity for all. So in other words, we have again this this reason that these works are being produced that is has everything to do with the context of the time right um, the other thing that i wanted to emphasize emphasize about this is when you have something as we do in this work that shows an interaction with native americans and the french in this case produced by the french for the french people Early on, um, again, unless you're trying to vilify another nation, as in the case of de Bry vilifying the Spanish, you want to show interactions being one that are mutually beneficial, or at least you want the public to believe this, um, and you want, um, of course, to show the natives welcoming you. So here we have all of that, right? A Tory puts his arm around uh, René de Lonier, uh, welcoming him. Uh, he is not in any way threatening. There's no weapons in their hands, all of that stuff, right? You want to make sure that you realize uh, in the work of art, meaning represent in the work of art, the idea that the power is in the hands of white Europeans. And so, again, the French have all the weaponry, they have the sophisticated armor, and so forth. This is meant to be secure to people. People are to look at this and feel safe to come to the new world. You also want to show the bounty, right? So here we have that bounty on the ground in front of you. As I said, some of this is fictitious. Not all of these fruits and vegetables came from uh, or could be found in Florida at the time, uh, but you want people to feel like, wow, uh, you know, there's tons and tons of stuff there for everyone and you'll be welcomed with open arms. So. As we go forward, and we did a little bit of this before, uh, we want to be paying attention to the way that the artist uses the formal elements, lines and shapes and colors, and uh, in particular here, composition, the arrangement of a picture so as to emphasize certain things over other things. So far, what we've really been doing is talking about what is included in the subject matter, right? So we're saying there's a Indian chief, there's the French here, there's a column that comes from an earlier moment in time of colonization. We've been reading some of the symbolism. We talked about the Valois uh, sigil that is on the uh, column, something that if you don't know what a fleur-de-lis is, of course, you're not going to know, but once you know that convention, you can recognize that. These are all ways that a work of art communicates to us. But primarily what we've been saying is what is included in this painting is 
natives worshiping a column that was left by the French. And we've been saying this is what that means, right? It shows that the natives are beholden to the French. They treat them as gods uh, come to earth. They're going to welcome you with open arms, that kind of stuff. We've been saying things like there's all that bounty that tells you this, right? You come to the new world, you're going to have all this. What we haven't been doing a ton of is saying, why is it arranged this way? Why does the artist choose to show it this way? We did a little bit of that when I said that Chief Atore is meant to look like an Apollo figure. He's mimicking the same pose that is used in Apollo statues going back to Greek and Roman times in order to emphasize the idea of his innate goodness. So we're doing a little bit of that. Uh, but we're not doing a ton or we did a little bit when we said look at the spear that is in front of a Tory and how that emphasizes the idea that one person has the power and the other one do doesn't as we keep going forward we'll do more and more of that kind of formal analysis and reading of the the visual imagery at a much more in-depth level but i wanted to start us off kind of simply i wanted to make sure in this brief recap that we understand what art history is about. It's not just about saying, here's what this represents. It's about saying, why is it represented this way? How can we find clues about why the artist represented it this way in the historical context? It gives us insight into what was going on in the world during these times, if we know how to read it. So then, going forward here, your first summary essay uh, will be on um, uh, these next two paintings uh, that are early, some of the earliest kind of what we think of as masterpieces in uh, colonial portraiture. We don't know who the artist is. Um, we usually refer to him as the freak. Limner, and this is Freak is the actual name of this family. This is John Freak, and in a moment here you'll see Elizabeth Freak with her child Mary Freak. So we don't know who the painter was, we don't have a name anyway, and we just assign this name to the anonymous painter saying, well, his major masterpiece was these these portraits of the Freak family. We're gonna call the this guy the Freak paint Limner. What is a Limner? Well, a limner is a term usually applied to early colonial painters um, who were not, I mean, they're, uh, what's the best way to put this? They are um, professional painters, but their primary job is not necessarily artistic painting. A limner might paint a sign for your store. They might paint your house. They might paint the masthead of a ship. And when called to, they had enough skill, probably basic training to paint a portrait of someone. Um, so it's the earliest form of painting in colonial America. This is the other key part of the artistic context that I want to talk about. Early on in the 17th century, and this will continue into the 18th and, and frankly even parts of the early 19th century in some areas, um, there's not a huge demand for art uh, in colonial America, as you might expect. Um, and there's no infrastructure to teach artists how to become artists. Uh, and if you are a particularly wealthy um, uh, uh, colonist, and this will become more so as we get closer to the revolution, generally speaking, many of these uh, colonists who had a lot of money wouldn't buy paintings from a kind of hack American painter. They'd go back to Europe and pick up some masterworks and adorn their homes with these. But here's the other part of this context. So we don't have a big demand for painters. You don't have a big demand for painters. You don't have any schools to teach them. It stands to reason you're not going to have the development of sophisticated types of painting in the United States. But the other thing to bring into this context is who were some of the original colonizers? And for the most part, in the areas that we're talking about here, for instance, here we're looking at parts of New England and Virginia and so forth along the eastern seaboard. Those original colonists, by and large, are um, come from England and they are Protestants. In particular, um, they adopt a form of Protestantism um, called Congregationalism, which you will hear quite a bit about in your first electronic reserve reading uh, by, uh, by um, Wayne Craven. 
So um, if you are a Protestant at this time, you are particularly suspicious of uh, art, of opulent images, particularly religious imagery. From the time of the Protestant Reformation starting in the early 16th century, there was a series of what are known as iconoclastic controversies, where Protestants, at least some Protestants, not all by any means, in fact, uh, Martin Luther actually came out against this, believed that religious imagery broke some of the rules in the Bible, particularly rules that were about the production of false idols and um, graven images. So that all of this religious imagery that was used by the Catholics became something of an anathema. They were things that were breaking rules. They were about indulgence. They were about material wealth. They were about everything that religion was not supposed to be about. And by extension, by the way, a lot of Protestants believed that imagery itself, these glamorous scenes of beautiful nudes and uh, and uh, Greek and Roman mythology or historical events were all luxurious vices and that you should stay away from those types of things, right? So there's already this kind of predominant idea that maybe painting wasn't the greatest thing, maybe art wasn't the greatest thing. You had to devote yourself to your spirituality. However, um, as Craven points out in your reading, um, these colonists very quickly on, right? They, they show up, let me back up here for a minute here, for just for a second. When the colonists first come to the Americas from England, uh, of course, they're fleeing England for a couple of main reasons, as I've said before. One of the big ones is in England, land is scarce. There's a, uh, a law in place called the Law, law of Primogenitor, uh, which means that only the firstborn can inherit wealth. Um, they're, they're fleeing for religious reasons. Maybe their particular form of Protestantism doesn't line up quite nicely with Anglicanism and so forth. And they come to the United, what will become the United States, and they form their new forms of government that are based upon, and here we are in New England, Massachusetts primarily, um, based upon uh, a kind of... Uh, agreement that is put into place between um, someone who is a patron who gives you the right to go do this and funds your enterprise uh, to go colonize. And in the case of New England, of course, many of you know this is um, this colonization starts with the, the signing of the Mape Flower uh, Compact. And this institutes a new form of government based upon uh, an ideal form of governance with the consent and approval of the governed. Right, so that you have basically people elected into power, they rule by consent of the people, uh, and you have this, you know, this land of opportunity and religious tolerance in place. These people, though, very quickly on, uh, of course, want to prosper. It's not just about uh, religious freedom. They want to make some money. They want to, they're, many of them are ambitious. Uh, mercantilism, which is part of your optional reading, is of course maybe the most uh, ambitious form of getting ahead at this time in the colonies. Mercantilism is just trade, right? So you're figuring out ways to profit from what you're finding uh, in terms of maybe it's fish, maybe it's textiles, maybe it's furs, it can be any number of things to trade those to gain material wealth. So while the first people in might have been hard and fast Puritans, as mercantilism becomes prominent, there's this kind of wedding together of the, uh, this devotion to one's faith with ambition to prosper in terms of monetary material wealth. Your first reading goes into this in depth. And this is the other part of the context we have to talk about. These people who are making money, who are getting ahead, want the one thing that all upper middle class people of this time have in their homes. And this is, goes back, you know, uh, a very long time in European traditions. They want a portrait of themselves. Primarily, they want that portrait because that portrait shows right off the bat that they have some wealth, that they can buy a portrait of themselves, and they want to project an image of themselves to the guests in their home and, frankly, to themselves. 
right? So how then do they represent this image of themselves to the world? What goes into that? I always stop here and say, just stop for a minute and think about what portraits are and what portraits do, right? Portraits are ways that we represent ourselves to ourselves and to the larger world. In this age of social media and selfies all over the place, think about what you are doing when you take a picture of yourself or have someone take a picture of yourself or choose a picture to show someone else in the world. We tend to pick pictures knowing in advance, at least to some degree, how they will be received by the general public, don't we? We pick pictures oftentimes that make us look a little bit better than maybe we oftentimes look. Sometimes we're wearing like our, our best clothes. Uh, sometimes we're in spots that tell the world something about us at a sports event, out in nature, surfing, whatever it might be, right? We are, in other words, picking images that are coded in a way for our public that will be able to read them and say, oh, this is Colia. Here's how he presents himself to the world. This is what this means. And of course, portraits have done that forever. What I'm getting at here is that when these early colonists were projecting an image of themselves to themselves and to the public, they were conforming that image of themselves to prevailing values in the world. Now we oftentimes think again that somehow material wealth and spiritual calling are different. That had been taught to people for a very long time. But Congregationalists adopted the theology of a very important figure uh, in the world, right? And we've been, uh, you've read uh, all about this man. His name was Calvin, right? Thomas Calvin uh, basically taught the idea that we shouldn't just be um, trying to be good spiritual people on earth. We should also be following and this is a simplified version, you're going to have to go into the details in your reading. We should also be following our secular calling, secular meaning everyday calling, that God wanted us not only to be good spiritual people, he wanted us to be industrious, he wanted us to be frugal, he wanted us to achieve um, something in our everyday calling, our work calling. And if we did that, and again, I'm just giving you the simple version of Calvinism. If we did that, if we pursued our secular calling, he would, in essence, reward us with material wealth. So if you're working hard, you're being frugal, you're being, you're, they call it sobriety, meaning being serious about your work, what we sometimes call the Puritan work ethic, a lot of other people call it the Protestant work ethic, excuse me, Protestant work ethic, because it's not just about Puritans. That's what we're talking about here. You're supposed to work hard at whatever your job is. In these cases, merchants working very hard will be rewarded. On earth, they will be rewarded with material wealth. This is actually God saying, here you go. You worked hard, you were frugal, um, you're industrious, right? You're sober, you're, you're serious about your life. Here's some pleasure. Here's some material wealth. So that's one side. If you are also a good spiritual person, after you die, of course, you get rewarded with grace in heaven. So when these, again, congregationalists and merchant class people who adopt this idea of Calvin, and it'll continue all the way, frankly, until the current times. I mean, this is at the basis of a lot of people showing off their material wealth. It's as if they're saying, listen, I'm doing good for the world. Therefore, I get rewarded with all of this material wealth, right? And it's not quite that easy as we know. Um, you will show that material wealth in your portraiture in various ways. The other side of this, though, is the flip side of this, which is to say, that in showing off some degree of your material wealth, you're showing the world that you are in the favor of God. It's not just showing on the civic level or on the industrious level, look at how hard I work, look at what I've achieved, although that's in there as well. It's also saying, God is favoring me. Look at what I have in terms of material wealth. 
Now, the one thing that is not talked about, I haven't talked about yet, is what is the limit on this? Because I already started this off by saying, of course, the Protestants think that the Catholics are incredibly luxurious, full of vice and vile, that they're, um, you know, flamboyant with their wealth, they're ostentatious, they're full of greed and avarice and so forth. Isn't this close to that? And the answer is, it is. But of course, Calvin said, you should always put a limit on that. Ostentation is too much. But he left it up to individuals and society to kind of figure out what that limit was. When do you go too far? When are you too um, flamboyant with your show of wealth? When are you too materialistic? Well, that was up to individuals. And by extension, of course, individuals are parts of society. And so it was society that basically said, mm, that's going too far, right? So then coming back to this work, how do we see that in this portrait of John Freak, right? How is that encoded in here? Well, the first thing to notice is what is understood by material wealth. The first thing is, a portrait itself, right? Having a painting of yourself is a symbol of material wealth. Number two, just about everything he's wearing. So if you go into the optional reading, which I, I think you should at least skim it, you'll see this all listed. All of his clothing is imported. He's wearing black, or I'm sorry, dark brown velvet, right? Dark brown probably can't quite see it here in this slide, is done on purpose. It's not black. Black would be too associated with the Puritans. The Puritans are a little bit too... Puritanism is, by this point in time, for the merchant class, while they are still, to some degree, Puritans, extreme Puritanism is seen as associated with lower-class individuals and too fervent of a, uh, of a uh, religi religiosity. So he's picked brown here, brown velvet, that's expensive. His collar and his sleeves are lace. He has a beautiful worked silver uh, brooch on his uh, chest here. All of his buttons are beautifully worked silver with silver thread in the buttonholes. Um, he's wearing a beautiful golden ring. And there's, of course, embroidery all over the place. All of this would have had to have been imported. Anything imported, especially luxury items like this, show wealth, don't they? Number two, he's holding in his hand gloves. Gloves are a symbol of a gentleman, someone who knows his social standing in the world. Number three, his hair. I know this is a, a strange thing, but just think about it a little bit. I don't, I'm, again, maybe... Um, uh, think about the way that hairstyles symbolize various things in our own world to some degree, right? So here his hair is neither super short, super short hair uh, at the time um, is the style that was used by strict Puritans. They're called round heads, by the way. It's kind of like a bowl cut. Um, and uh, therefore, it's associated with the lower class and someone who's just a little bit too committed to one's religiosity and not enough committed to one's secular calling in the world. He also doesn't have incredibly long hair. His hair is just shoulder length. If it's very, very long, something that they call love locks, that was associated with ostentation, with the French, with the Baroque, with the Spanish, with people who are associated with Catholicism in particular, with people who were rogues. And as Wayne Craven points out, um, this kind of roguish long hair or love locks was something that was, quote, a vile abuse, an invitation to lust and sodomy, end quote. So his hair is kind of right in between there. Then there's something that's a little bit harder to see in these portraits, and that's that the very style itself, which many of you can tell, it looks kind of flat, doesn't it? It doesn't look incredibly three-dimensional. The lines on the sides of the faces are pretty severe. Part of this is because, of course, these limners aren't incredibly accomplished painting painters, but the other part has much more to do with 
a stylistic affinity to particular types of portraiture that came out of England. And what I mean by that is that what the artist is doing here with this very kind of flat, almost two-dimensional style with a hard linearity is associating this portrait of John Freak with other portraits in Elizabethan and Jacobean England. In other words, kind of medieval portraiture that are seen as, or neo-medieval portraiture, that are seen as um, attaining the same kinds of goals that this artist, uh, this uh, sitter is. Let me say that again. These earlier portraits, and let me just show you one of these. Oh, back up. These portraits, such as the one that you see on the right, uh, and this is a, uh, a noble woman, are severe, they're linear, they're meant to impress upon us the Protestant values of England, right? Versus the ostentation and the incredible um, kind of humanistic portraits that would have come out of Baroque uh, uh, Spain or France or even Italy. So in other words, that flatness, that linearity, that kind of stylization of the portrait is meant to have an affinity with earlier portraits that came out of England for one reason I gave you to show a, a religious affinity and for another reason, which is it shows also a country of origin. These um, these new colonists uh, in New England are seeking to um, seeking to show their cultural heritage back to England, at least at this point. And this is one of the ways they do it. So then let's go on to John Freak's wife. Um, this is and, and child here. This is Elizabeth Freak and her child Mary from 1674-ish. These, by the way, are fairly moderate sized paintings. They're about four by three. Um, they're uh, oil paintings. And once again, we see uh, a lot of the same uh, interest in showing off that material wealth that shows that they are good Puritans or good Protestants, that they've been industrious and frugal uh, and uh, show sobriety in their labor uh, and that they've been rewarded by material wealth. In this case, in um, you can probably see it in Elizabeth Freak's uh, outfit. She's wearing lace. She's wearing, um, you know, beautiful uh, uh, lace ribbons. She's wearing, um, you know, silks on her. She's got a, a pearl necklace around her ne neck and three strands. She's a, got a garnet a bracelet around her wrist. All of these are imported from different parts of Europe uh, into even parts of the Far East, right? So these are all things that show wealth. Even the child Mary shows these things with linens and laces uh, and satins on uh, that she's wearing. Further on, she's covering up her hair. This is very common uh, at this time. It's it's seen as a way to be uh, humble before the world, humble before God. It's also a way to cover up something that was seen as sexual for women. Their hair was something that was about allure, and so covering it up was a form of modesty. Further, she is sitting in what's called a turkey work chair. A turkey work chair is a chair that is upholstered in fabric that looks a a little bit like a Turkish rug, which is why it's given that name. These are, the, you know, the, the most fancy forms of furniture that you can have at this time. So again, to recap, you show this material wealth in imported fabrics, imported uh, furniture. You draw stylistic affinities to earlier forms of art to show your devotion to God, but also to show uh, what you've achieved by pursuing your um, your secular calling and showing the world in turn that you are in the favor of God. And this happens over and over and over again. This is uh, an unknown, uh, it's probably by the same painter, the Freak uh, Limner, uh, painting of the, the Mason children. And you'll see tons of these, right? That's a, a young man. He's already affecting the gesture of what he will be when he becomes a full-grown man. He has the gloves in his hand. He's wearing imported clothes. He's got a beautiful staff with a silver um, tip on it. 
the young girls, and we don't know how old they're supposed to be here. They're probably supposed to be, you know, six and three or so, are uh, wearing all those clothes as well. They have an imported fan in the one in the middle. Um, the girl on the far right is holding a flower in her hand. That's a symbol of fertility, believe it or not. And you'll see that over and over again with women that they'll hold fruit or they'll hold flowers because it's their fundamental role in the world to produce children. Or this one, to bring in another very brief point, um, this is an unknown painter. This is Elizabeth Edgington uh, from a little bit, uh, right around the same time period as these, a little bit before. Um, again, with the same thing, she's got her hair covered, she's wearing imported fabrics, beautiful laces, she's got this beautiful kind of feather a fan in her hand. Um, the thing that you can't tell from this picture is that she uh, actually died at the age of eight, and it's quite likely that this is a picture that is meant to immortalize her. Um, early portraits not only represented people during their life, but oftentimes um, they were meant to be what are called memento mores, or reminders of the fleetingness of life or the passing of someone. This is something, by the way, that they do when they first invent photography, as they take pictures of people right after they die so that people can have some visual record of who that person was. So then just to show you some of the other types of portraits that are around uh, at the time, because not every single one, although the vast majority are, like the Freak Limner, I wanted to show you the self-portrait by Thomas Smith. Uh, Thomas Smith was a mariner, a uh, tradesman. He made a lot of material wealth. He wants to show some of that off again with his clothes. He's got the same kind of hair again. But he also wants to show you a little bit more. First of all, that he's cultivated. He took up painting late in life and learned it probably um, in his travels from the Dutch. He has a lot more, you can probably see this volume to his face. It looks a lot more three-dimensional. If you follow with me, you see a lot more what we call modeling. There's a lot more shading of this form with big highlights to give you a little bit more three-dimensionality here. Um, this is probably because of his own heritage, frankly. He also shows you through a window a little bit about his life, right? Instead of just showing you what he wears and his material wealth, he wants to tell you a little bit about what he did. He worked on ships, right? He made his wealth uh, through mercantilism and through being a mariner. He also shows you up here a fort with a flag on the top. This may be a reference to a particular battle. I don't need you to remember here that he either participated in or more likely uh, supplied ships in in order to uh, win this battle. And then finally in the foreground you see this writing. Generally speaking when you see writing uh, on a picture it's meant to of course uh, tell you something about um, uh, the scene itself. In this case this is a poem by the artist and the sitter that is is what's known as a memento mori again or a vanitas type of picture. Memento mori means reminder of death. Vanitas, uh, taken from the Latin for vanity, has the same idea behind it, which is an artist represents a scene or gives you some kind of reminder in a picture that life is fleeting, that we're all going to die, that our material wealth and our pursuits during life, while very important, are of course just in advance of the real goal in the end, which is everlasting grace with God in heaven. All of these people are religious to some degree or another. And in this case, the poem, which is translated slightly differently in your text, is written by the artist and it says, quote, why, why should I, the world, be minding there, therein a world of evils, finding then farewell world Farewell thy years, thy joys, thy toils, thy wiles, thy watts. Truth sounds retreat. I am not sorry. The eternal draws to him my heart. By faith which can thy force subvert to crown me after grace with glory. In other parts of the colonies, particularly if we move a little bit further south and look at this artist um, here, this is again next down on your lecture guide. This is Justus Kuhn, 
uh, and this is Henry Darnell III from around 1710, uh, you see different types of portraits. So we're a little bit further advanced in time, about 30, 40 years further along than what we saw in the Freak Painter. And Thomas Kuhn, in this case, is probably trained in Germany to some degree. He painted for rich plantation owners. Uh, in this painting, Henry Darnell III, what we see is a totally imaginative, fictitious scene uh, in order to make this young master, someone who is eventually going to grow up to inherit the plantation, look fantastic and his life look powerful. He's wearing again those fancy clothes with all the imported fabrics that we've seen before. He has symbols of being a gentleman uh, in uh, in frankly, in what is around him, this beautiful and completely, by the way, fictitious landscape filled with fountains and huge buildings, part of the supposedly the plantation. There were no plantations that looked like this at the time, so it's to make him look better than he actually did. But what I really want to pay attention to here, what I want to emphasize in this picture, is something that almost fades into the background, but it really shouldn't. To our left, you see a young slave. That young slave is wearing a silver collar around his neck, a symbol that he is a slave, right? This is someone who is owned by someone else. Those plantations that will prosper, and frankly, the economic um, you know, boon that the South was to this, when this nation comes together, was, we need to remember, founded on the backs of people who were owned as property and treated horribly by such people as we see here. This isn't to blame him, and it's not to cast guilt on us. It's to remember what this country was founded on, part of our history. This young slave looks beholden in the same way that we saw the Native Americans beholden to that column. He looks up demurely. He carries the hunt a some kind of fowl or bird to his master who holds in his hand a bow and arrow the idea is that he's almost like a dog retrieving that game for his master and if that weren't enough i just wanted to show you one more picture by justice kuhn this is charles carroll of annapolis again virginia another rich plantation owner uh, just as Kuhn tended to paint for these. And here you see this pet deer that has the same collar, right? So pets, someone who is owned, something that is owned, something that is there for you. That is just part of the visual language of this period. They didn't think of people of color as really having the same humanity as whites. They didn't think of people, frankly, that didn't come from Europe as having the same humanity that whites. There was prejudice very early on in uh, the Americas, of course, and it shows up in these works of art. Again, because it's in your um, textbook, I just wanted to show you a couple of works by an early female portraitist. This is Henrietta Johnson. This is Mrs. Samuel Prilia. Uh, Prilia uh, was a, a family of Huguenots. Um, and frankly, again, Huguenots being French, uh, um, French Protestants here. Um, this artist primarily, because she was a French Protestant who came from uh, France through England to the United States, who had to make some money for her family. Her husband was notoriously bad with money, kept kind of bankrupting the f uh, family, uh, painted portraits of uh, the uh, these Huguenot uh, groups that were in her in her community. Um, she paint or painted. She didn't actually paint. I shouldn't have said that. These are not paintings at all. They are pastels, and that's really important here. Uh, pastels were a kind of emerging in France around the same time as a legitimate high art form within the style known as the Rococo. The Rococo style flourished uh, after the death of Louis XIV with the reign of Louis XV in France. It was a very flamboyant style, a style associated with the French aristocracy, very much in vogue, very kind of sensual, um, and something that, uh, that obviously in this case the artist is trying to 
draw a connection between these people who understand themselves as coming from France back to the main styles in France. The other thing about pastels, though, is that they are an art form that were oftentimes cultivated among the upper class women to show that they were uh, civilized, that they had affected culture, that they had learned uh, to create art. And so this woman artist using a, a type of medium associated with women artists in France is important here as well. Now, stylistically, you can probably see that the big wide eyes, the very, very uh, sketchy quality of the pastel, the, the low cut dress, these are all different than what you would see, of course, in those portraits that you saw uh, by the freak Limner. And they're because we're representing slightly different values for a slightly different group of people. And it shows up also here in her portrait of um, uh, Colonel Prilia, uh, who is the husband of the one we just saw uh, before, who has that kind of, again, he's got love locks, right? He's got tons and tons of hair, but because he's not associated with the Puritan or Congregationalists in New England, and instead is uh, trying to associate himself with France, um, this is perf perfectly appropriate. So I'm going to pause here for a minute. You'll oftentimes see these quick breaks uh, by me, but I will be right back. All right, sorry about that. Um, so back to the show. Uh, I'm gonna go through some of these rather quickly. This isn't, I think, at least for me, it's not one of the more exciting points of the course, of course. I like the idea of portraiture. I especially like um, you know, these ones that you can get into more depth about, but some of these works, I just wanna show you what's going on at this time and give you more more visual examples of different um, painters at the time that you might not be able to find in your textbook, right? So this is a painting by someone who was considered to be one of the first really successful portrait painters, uh, professional portrait painters in uh, the colonial period. His name was John Smybert. Oh, I'm sorry, why is this one on here? I'm, I'm <laughs> sorry. Do, do, do. Somehow I skipped ahead a bunch. Um, this is uh, the painter John Smybert, excuse me here, um, who was uh, trained in England. Uh, John Smybert uh, trained in England for, um, for a number of years. And then he came to, he was born in Scotland, but trained in England, studied in Italy for three years, comes to, uh, to the Americas, North America, with this man that you see off on the right hand side in this picture uh, this is dean berkeley yes that same family of berkeley's that gives the california school its name um, who was uh, seeking to start a college um, so that college ended up failing he didn't get the funding that he needed and this picture that you see here is actually called the bermuda group where they paused in bermuda in order to found this college uh, and you see off on the right, Dean Berkeley, and off to the left, actually, if you follow my cursor, this is John Smybert himself in his self-portrait here looking back out at us. And then he's basically trying to show off the other members of the faculty who are coming on, their wives, their child, uh, and so forth, right? It's what's called a conversation piece in terms of a painting. It's a, an excuse to show a lot of characters in the same space, supposedly in conversation, although they don't necessarily have to be talking to one another, uh, so that you can get away from those really, really boring group portraits where everyone just stands in a line and looks back out um, you know, at us. Um, the reason I show you this is really to just get us started to talk about, you know, what looks different about this than, than the pictures that you've seen so far. John Smybert, having been trained, obviously has a lot more uh, capability of showing what we call volumetric form, forms that look three-dimensional. And the way that you create the illusion of three dimensions, if we just look here at Dean uh, Berkeley's face, is of course uh, through a method known as modeling of form, or the Italians call it chiaroscuro, uh, or we sometimes just uh, call it shading. 
the basic premise is that things that are closer to a light source, and in this case you can see the highlight here coming from here, so we've got a light source up in this area, are going to be the lightest part of a form, and things that are progressively further away get slightly darker as they get further away. It's one of those ways that we create the illusion of three-dimensionality. He's also got a very good understanding of how to pose figures naturally, right? I don't need to go into all the ins and outs of this because I, you know, um, it's not really what this class is about at this stage. But I do want to say that you can tell when an artist has been trained uh, in artistry for a number of years under a master artist that they have more skill than other artists might have. But the other thing to say about this is, remember that if we were, if John Smybert was being asked to paint a picture of John Freak, he wouldn't paint it this way, or he wouldn't be asked to paint it this way, or John Freak wouldn't have sought him out. This kind of volumetric form is very closely associated with humanism, with the idea of learning, with things that aren't, strictly speaking, all just about religiosity. It's also the case that the artist is trying to draw connections to um, other things than, let's say, Elizabethan and uh, Jacobean portraits, as was the case with John Freak. He's got that skill, and he's using that skill in this case because that's what would have been expected in this portrait, this very big portrait, by the way. So, a couple of other things. This is Jane Clark by uh, John Smybert. Um, again, very well trained. He was someone who uh, completed at least 250 uh, portraits in the Americas. He worked in New England, as most of these people did. So, around Boston is the main uh, center of New England at this time. Um, and in this portrait of Jane Clark that I bring in, I just want to kind of make one point here. So when we represent men, when we represent women, as I've said before, portraits, of course, represent people according to what is expected uh, of them or what's going to be esteemed of them by the contemporary society in which they are projecting themselves, in which they are representing themselves. Men are going to, of course, want to be associated with particular values, women with other values. When we are talking about portraits that are created in the early 1700s or mid 1700s in this case, the way that people think about gender is hard and fast. There are men, there are women, there's no fluidity between these genders in the way a lot of us think about gender today. Each gender has a very particular role for the most part. We're gonna see this in a couple of weeks um, be tested by a couple of thinkers. Um, but at this point, women's primary role in the world is to produce children, right? So to be the mother, to be the nurturer, to stay at home. When we represent a young woman, as you see here, you're going to have all of these little different symbols or allusions. Allusion, A-L-L-U-S-I-O-N, so to allude to something. Uh, are ways to kind of tell the story through symbolic or iconographic means. In this case, holding fruit in her hand or vegetables in her hand or something that's ripe is a symbol of fertility, right? That she holds it up near her breast isn't by accident. The artist would, if called out on this, say, oh no, I'm not doing that, but of course they do it all the time that the shape of the fruit mimics the shape of her lips or her cheeks is on purpose, right? That the color of the fruit that she holds in her hand looks like the color of her dress and her cheeks and her lips is on purpose. She is ripe like the fruit, right? So why? It's to tell you that she can produce children. Women oftentimes are very closely associated with nature. And so in this case, and it won't just be the case that you see women, men as well will be out in nature, but very, very commonly, women will be sitting in a natural scene. This is to draw the association between women and Mother Earth in a way, if I'm going to make it just kind of really straightforward. Um, and by contrast, many times men will be associated with culture, with households, with their with their material wealth, with what they do out there in the world. But like women's bodies are procreative, so is nature procreative. Accompanying that, of course, is the other big thing in the way that women are represented. 
women are represented so as to be physically attractive. We've already talked about that a little bit here, right? The rhyming of the fruit with her lips and her breasts and so forth. But the beauty of a woman is the other thing that is very highly esteemed, their physical appearance in the world, much more so than men. And so more often than not, women are idealized in portraiture. We'll see this be tested in the America over and over again, unlike Europe that without even thinking about it, always idealizes women's looks. In the Americas, many times we are very um, beholden to the idea of realism or naturalism and you won't idealize as much. But one can presume that with the rosiness of the cheeks, with if we had looked at many, many portraits by John Smybert, you'll see the same look. They have bigger eyes, fuller lips, you know, glossier hair and so forth. You begin to get the idea that, wow, he's kind of submitting what someone looks to, to a particular ideal type. I just wanted to show you that, you know, this is a very simple picture of Boston by John Smybert to give you an idea of what it looks like. All those steeples you see there, various churches. Uh, so lots and lots of religiosity uh, in this neck of the woods. It's not big as it is today. You still have farmland right across the bay and lots of ships in the harbor. And then to just bring up one more point with painters. John Smybert was classically trained, right? So if he was in Europe, along with portraits, which are seen as the lowest kind of form of artistry in Europe, he would have been expected to produce um, what are known as history paintings, P paintings that have religious subjects or historical subjects or Greek mythological subjects and so forth. And in Europe, frankly, and this is probably one of the reasons that he stayed in uh, North America, he would have been a, let's say, at best, mediocre artist. This is his version of a mythological subject called Hector leading Andromaca. It's a, a story of Hector is the, the major hero on the Trojan side of the, the Trojan War. Um, leaving his wife um, to go off into battle. And here you see this going on. Um, if we're in Europe, you know, this is not a very accomplished painting. Um, and I'm not going to go into all the reasons why, but he, he really wouldn't have been able to, let's say, prosper at the same level that he did in, the United, uh, in North America at this time. But the other thing that I wanted to say about this is, so why isn't he producing lots of these pictures for people in in uh, colonial America. Like, why aren't they buying these subjects that are so popular in Europe? Part of it's already been said, right? A very Protestant, sometimes Puritan-oriented society is a little bit suspicious of artistry in general. They're su suspicious in particular of these grand traditions that are associated with big Catholic uh, countries. But the other part is, if you had enough money and you had an inclination to purchase a grand history painting, you probably would go to Europe and pick one up from one of the great masters rather than someone that was in uh, colonial America who wasn't as, let's say, as good or frankly as trained as those European masters at the time. So then, <clears throat> sorry that I got ahead of myself uh, with this one. Moving on, just uh, to show you a couple more of these group portraits. This is uh, Robert Feck's work. Robert Feck actually studied under John Smybert. This is Isaac Royal and his family from 1741. It is again, what is known as a, a conversation piece. Um, Roger, um, Robert Feck was native born in the United States. He had no formal training before he trained under Smybert and he used what are called mezzotints. These are prints that have been colored in order to train himself. And for not having any kind of classical training, he's done a pretty good job here. It's a, another conversation piece of putting Isaac Royale uh, up here in the uh, standing up, very common at this time to have men standing up and women sitting down, men associated, see over here with a window, that's the outside world, and women sitting at the furniture, which is part of the domestic interior. You even see a little scene of nature over here on the women's side. 
Um, the artist is trying to do um, something to connect all the figures together through the use of line. It's not doing a great job of it. And what I mean by that is if you look at uh, Isaac Royale, his hand points this way. That is then mirrored by the hand here of his wife who points over to her sister. The arm of the child here points to the sister. The sister points over to the other sister trying to connect these all together compositionally. The child, um, this is a, 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 a funny thing. This is a toy that's in its hand, but it almost looks, some of my students see when you see it on a big screen, you can see it much better, like some kind of strange knife. And with that child that looks so awkward, I mean, just not particularly an accomplished painting, um, you know, it looks like some strange creature that might show up in a horror movie. Um, I only say this because, um, you know, the ability for an artist to depict a child accurately is, is not common, uh, ever. Some of the greatest masters of all time cannot depict children, partially because they can't sit still, uh, and partially because children's um, you know, proportionality is very uh, odd anyway. The only reason, by the way, that uh, Feck got this commission for this very important family was at the time John Smybert was ill. You can see how he's kind of adopted the same compositional format. He's learning from the master of the time, it's something you see a lot of artists do. They'll basically draw compositions, meaning the arrangement of figures in space from one another. So then uh, moving on again, this is Joseph Blackburn's work called Isaac Winslow and his family. So Isaac Winslow uh, is, uh, uh, again, a, another important family, uh, an important um, figure in the world. Uh, in this case, you see him standing up once again. Uh, you see his wife sitting down in the domestic furniture, and you see, of course, the younger girl, uh, the, not the youngest, but the girl holding fruit uh, in the body of her dress, you know, very uh, importantly displayed here so as to show, um, you know, her fertility. Just running through those very quickly here so that we can get to the major, very accomplished colonial uh, American portraitist. Uh, this is John Singleton Copley. Uh, John Singleton Copley um, is, I mean, he's kind of baffling uh, to me. He was, as far as we can tell, trained primarily through, um, I mean, with very moderate training by some of the, the people that we've just talked about. He seems to have been primarily self-taught, right? So he seems to have been one of those artists who had a great facility uh, to, to copy what he saw, to actually look at something and to translate it into a painting with a kind of facility that makes a lot of us quite jealous. Um, in this case, you're looking at a very early portrait by John Singleton Copley of Mrs. Joseph Mann. By this point, uh, Copley has learned a little bit from his father who was an engraver. He's used those mesotents. He's visited John, um, John Smybert's gallery of portraits to explore those. He may have gotten a little training under Smybert. It's not entirely uh, clear. Uh, but in this picture, which again, it, you're probably thinking, well, that doesn't look that great. You should be aware that he painted this portrait when he was 15 years old with, again, very minimal training. Or if we look at him trying his hand at uh, mythological subjects. This is Galatea, which I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, but she's a, a subject of Greek mythology, and you see Poseidon over here on the side. He's obviously seen someone else's picture that he is uh, emulating. He did this when he was 16 years old. Pretty good for someone self-taught. And then uh, a few years later, one of his major masterpieces, so let's see, he's not quite 20 years old, is Mary and Elizabeth Royale. Um, uh, Elizabeth Royale uh, over here is the, actually the daughters. Uh, these are the daughters, so they grew up to be, this one was the one that was in the, the Feck picture, to be fairly, um, um, you know, compared to that kind of holding the, the strange 
toy thing and looking like a creepy little child, they ended up being quite beautiful, didn't they? He is incredible when it comes to copying drapery, at copying what he sees, at giving you a very naturalistic form. It's not clear to what degree he, uh, you know, changes this form in order to um, be in line with various ideals, but he is He's unrivaled at the time. He's so sought after in uh, New England uh, that he is going to just make boatloads of money over and over again. Everyone's going to seek him out through his career. So again, this child grows into this child. Who would have thunk it? And I just wanted to show you some close-ups of this. Again, oil painting on canvas, sometimes on board, um, something that gives you a, a lot of ability to create a very volumetric forms and a lot of detail. Um, the child holds in her hand, in this case, a, uh, a little bird. Um, this is very common to show women, again, in contact with nature as being nurturing, as being kind and so forth. And the other child over here. This is a close-up of the drapery. Um, it's very common at this time, especially uh, for, um, for artists that are seeking to represent something naturally, to have this kind of flourish of brush strokes when you get up close on something. Of course, it just looks like brush strokes and you take a couple of steps back and it looks like really, really detailed drapery. All of the cracking that you see in painting, this is just a product of paintings, oftentimes either on canvas or on board, drying over time and they develop little cracks in them that are sometimes conserved, meaning fixed up, and other times they're left to be as they are. He painted them these portraits, uh, hundreds of them, for uh, the rich uh, in New England, primarily Bostonians. Um, this is a portrait of Governor Moses Gill, so the governor of Boston at the time. Again, standing, um, looking quite self-satisfied, I must say. Probably some of you are wondering, why do we keep getting these curtains in these scenes? That's a artistic device that's supposed to, you know, be a little bit theatrical. It's something that's adopted from uh, Baroque paintings in Europe that just becomes a kind of fashionable thing. Um, nothing to really go into here. The major painting that I want to focus on when it comes to portraits and John Singleton Copley's work is, uh, Copley's work, is this work called Mrs. Thomas Boylston. And yes, when of this time are called by their husband's names, so Mrs. Thomas Boylston. And to talk a little bit about something that's, I think, rather peculiar to American painting at this time, um, something that flies in the face with uh, European idealizations of women. When we were looking at the paintings uh, of the Freak family, what we were saying is that there's a correlation between their wealth, their material wealth, and um, their this being a kind of reward from God and thus their favor in the eyes of God, right? That doesn't go away. As I said before, you can still find some of this idea around today, even if it's in, let's say, less religious terms, the idea that someone who has tons of wealth is deserving of it. Um, the more you get into the way that economics and political power structures work, the less convinced you might be of that. But in any case, at this time period, so now let's see, the date of Mrs. Thomas Boylston is 1766. We're about 100 years later than the freak Limner. Same ideas are in place. Mrs. Thomas Boylston was what was known as a grand dame. A grand dame in Massachusetts was the older wife of a man who was prominent in society. These were the women who behind the scenes really wielded a great deal of power, particularly on who would move up in the power structure of New England and who would be held back. They're the ones who invited people to parties, the ones that had congregations, the ones that actually, again, kind of pulled the strings behind the scenes, so to speak. Now, her wealth is evident. She's got beautiful satin dress. She's got silk. She's got laces, right? She's sitting in 
what's known as a Chippendale chair. These are the most kind of fashionable imported chairs in the world. She's sitting in an interior that didn't exist. This column that you see here is from a house that couldn't possibly have existed in Massachusetts at this time. But all of this material wealth, of course, is a way to say she's, first of all, powerful. She comes from a powerful, wealthy family. But also, she's been doing what it is her job to do, and she and her family has been rewarded by God with this material wealth. The thing that is, as I started this uh, discussion off, is peculiar, though, in a sense, to this painting, is how the artist has painted this woman. And I'm going to bring us in close here a little bit. Mrs. P Thomas Boylston is painted showing, as far as we can tell, her age, right? In Europe, it's not uncommon for an older woman to be painted 20, 30 years younger than she actually was to idealize her. In this case, however, you can see wrinkles. You can see almost like a, a little kind of older woman shadow. If, you, if I were able to show you this in real life, you can get up close to it. You can see almost little whiskers there. They're not quite, but they show you that kind of age. She has a, uh, an age spot on one side of her face. You can probably barely see this here. The artist does something to minimize that by putting it in the shadow of her nose, but he doesn't cover it up or completely, let's say, Photoshop it out of the picture, does he? He still allows it to exist. Now, why? What I want to make a claim for is that in the United States, sorry, we're not in the United States yet, we're still colonial America, but in what will in 10 years become the United States, um, excuse me here while I get my light back on. Let me pause for a second here. Sorry about that. Still getting to learn the ropes here. So in what I wanted to say is that in colonial America, there was a deep distrust of some European traditions, particularly uh, ostentation or, or elitism. And uh, excessive idealization of people was seen as false, of, as fake. You know, I think many people know that uh, one of the reasons that jo George Washington was so admired is that he didn't really care much about his appearance. He didn't wear those foppish powdered wigs that the English wore, right? He was seen as more real, more authentic. And we see some of that creep into the portraiture of the time. This older woman is totally showing her age. She's not being idealized. Yes, she shows all her material wealth, but he doesn't pretty up her face, so to speak. The other thing, so there's a certain degree of naturalism or realism in these pictures that you don't find in so many European traditions. The other really important thing about this is she is looking right back at you. This grand dame shows some power here. She doesn't look demurely off to the side or down at the ground or allow you to look at her with impunity. She looks right back out at you. She shows some power here. And that is something that is not particularly um, common in the representation of women, but it is more common in the United States or colonial America. Now, um, at a certain stage in his career, and for reasons that your text goes into um, surrounding his political affiliations and his ambition, uh, there was a certain moment in time where John Singleton Copley started to uh, communicate with a, a very famous American painter that you'll get to know fairly well a little bit later on. Um, I put him in a different thematic whose name was Benjamin West. Benjamin West had trained in Pennsylvania and then moved to England uh, where he continued his training and he moved, he was very, very talented. He moved up the echelons in European painting and became a major figure in what's known as the British Royal Academy to the arts. Um, a lot of American painters would go train under him for a period of time and then come back to uh, the, uh, the Americas to continue their, their trade. Uh, he was a kind of uh, a very sympathetic figure, someone that you could, if you were a fellow uh, American, rely upon to try to help you out if he could, if you went to further your career in Europe. So 
Um, Kabbalah is uh, very wealthy at this point. We're talking about the early 1770s. He's got four houses. He's got more patrons than he can possibly satisfy. Um, and, um, and he's a little bit worried about the political situation. Um, you, again, you can read about this in your textbook, but he has family ties to people who are in uh, the industry of trade that is uh, connected to the British that are part of the, the famous Boston Tea Party, where, of course, uh, in order to make a, a kind of revolt against taxation without representation, British uh, wares of tea are spilled into Boston Harbor. That hasn't happened yet, but he sees all of that on the horizon. It's right around the corner, and he begins kind of seeing what his options are in Europe. So he paints this picture. I'm not going to go into great detail about it. This is Henry Pelham, or sometimes known as Boy with a Squirrel. Uh, and he sends it off to Benjamin West, this painter in England, and says, hey, basically, do you think that if I came to England, I could have a career there? He's a big fish right now in the small pond of colonial America. He wants to see if there's something bigger for him uh, in England. And this is basically to show off, right? It's meticulously painted. Everything looks almost photorealistic. He's pictured uh, the young man. He's pictured something that's really hard. Um, this kind of foreshortening of the chain going over the, uh, the hand towards us. The beautiful rendition of the little squirrel here, a glass here, the, the, the reflection on the tabletop. Everything in this is meant to show off. And Benjamin West and takes it and he shows it around and people say, yeah, absolutely. Come to uh, England. Um, you know, we'll, we'll try to set you up. So he doesn't go right away. I just wanted to show you a couple of his, um, more of his major portraits, but he is going to go and he's going to try his hand there. Some of his other portraits, of course, are of some of the most prominent Bostonians of the time. This is Paul Revere. Paul Revere, um, many of us know that famous ride of Paul Revere, the British are coming kind of thing, uh, was also, of course, a very successful silversmith. So you see him here, uh, a merchant, he's got his imported fabrics uh, and he's holding in his hand uh, something that he's made himself. He's getting ready to engrave it. You see the engraving tools down here below. Um, it's a, a chance for, of course, the artist to show off his skill of representing a very uh, uh, reflective surface. But the big thing behind this is that he's got his hand on his chin because beyond just being a craftsman, uh, Paul Revere is being represented, this pose is as a thinker, as a philosopher, as someone who is more than just an industrious silversmith. He's someone who is thinking about the creation of this new nation and all of the potential that it can contain. And there's some of the details of how good he is at, um, you know, very, very accurate naturalistic form. So Copley goes to, to England uh, and he tries his hand there. Now, the, the short version of the story is, frankly, he's never going to be as successful in England as he was in a colonial America, primarily because England is hard at work at other styles of painting, classical styles of painting in particular. But one of his great masterpieces is this work called Watson and the Shark. Uh, Watson and the Shark, it, there's a long story behind this, and there's a really great series of interpretations in your textbook that are, um, let's say they're contentious, not everyone buys into them, but let me give you the basic story here. Mr. Watson was a mariner. He was someone who early in his career had had part of his leg uh, bitten off in an accident in Havana Harbor by a shark. He, later in his life, he hears of this American portrait painter being in England, and because he thinks that this man might have a, a better idea of what Havana Harbor is, which he didn't, by the way, um, uh, Watson had never seen this, he commissions this man to paint a picture that we call a historiated portrait. 
You don't need to remember that, but it's basically taking a moment of your past and representing that in a kind of fictitious form to tell the world something about yourself. So this early moment in Mr. Watson's life where he lost part of his leg by being bitten by a shark, for him symbolizes the idea of overcoming adversity and still making uh, you know, a great life for you, himself. He went on to own fleets. He uh, made a boatload of money in trade. He also seems to have played around quite a bit in the, the, this, uh, in the slave trade. I'll come back to that in, uh, in a moment here. Um, and he wants to show that kind of moment in life. Now, if you were to look at this picture, and I'm, again, just talking about the basic level, from about midpoint up, it works really well. You've got this beautiful seascape, again, just to get our terminology underneath us. We've got uh, atmospheric perspective where ships that are further away uh, have far less detail and as they get closer to us, they have more detail. We've got size diminution. We've got the, the really accurate representation of clouds here. You've got what's known as a pyramidal composition, which is the standard way to build up form in classical works of art, where they look like a big triangle that creates a certain degree of stability in a picture. And here, everyone's working hard to pull poor Watson out of the water before the shark makes another pass and kills him, right? From here up, it looks great. From here down, it looks really wonky especially Mr. Watson, who I always want to say, dude, you know, turn over and swim away or something. Why are you floundering around on your back? But the reason for this is um, because John Singleton Copley is trying to copy some of the ideals that were at work in history painting in Europe at the time. He's actually stolen the pose of Watson from a Greek Hellenistic sculpture and copied it. It's his way of showing that he understands anatomy, which frankly he didn't understand that very well because he hadn't been trained like classical artists in Europe had to study the nude, nude sculptures, create perfect proportionality of body parts and so forth. So he just basically almost like copies it and pastes it in this picture and it looks a little bit like that with some tiny little indication of the bite marks of a shark over here. Where it goes in my mind, horribly wrong, is with the shark himself that looks like some strange cartoon shark. As I said, Copley knows how to paint what he sees, but when it comes to things that he hasn't seen before, he's not particularly good at it. And so he creates this shark that looks like he's made out of plastic, who has lips. Because, after all, the one thing he has seen of a shark is the jawbone of a shark. Someone should have just told him that that jawbone goes underneath the skin, not over the skin. By the way, there are at least three versions of this in the United States in various uh, museums on the East Coast that you will run across. It's a very big painting. The more complicated interpretations of this have to do with what's going on with the, uh, the black man or the I can't even call him an African-American, probably someone who was brought over in the transatlantic stra uh, slave trade. He's almost assuredly at this point a slave uh, in the scene who holds a rope. The one thing that kind of connects or has the possibility of connecting Watson to his uh, safe passage, but isn't doing anything here. He's just kind of in the center of the picture. Now, interpretations uh, vary widely, as you'll see in your textbook, but one of them is this kind of implicit commentary about the impending revolution in the, Uni in the United States now. Um, and the way that this interpretation goes at, at its basic level is that the kind of turmoil that is being caused, in other words, the shark eating up people, that kind of turmoil that is going to be caused, or the... Um, you know, the colonists in what will become the United States eating up all the things that belong to the British um, is a bad thing, of course, for someone like Watson, who is British. In England at this time, slavery was outlawed. And so the implicit story is something like, look at those Americans still own slaves, but they and don't treat them as free. And then they're calling themselves slaves to us. What hypocrisy. That's the basic kind of interpretation uh, of that at some level. 
Other interpretations have to do with allusions to the Boston Tea Party and uh, Copley's own um, uh, affiliations in that scenario. But let's get in here close because in his studies of what later on we'll call African Americans, but I just feel it like it's hypocritical to say that here. People of African derivation, uh, people who are most likely slaves, um, people who were at this time called Negroes, um, is, um, is remarkable. It's one of the very few very careful studies of a person of color uh, at this time that shows them, as far as we can tell, incredibly realistically, actually how they look as a real human being. We'll see all kinds of stereotypes of people of color, um, and we've already seen a few of those of Aboriginal peoples of North America uh, as we go forward in this class. So I want to end up this discussion of portraiture fairly quickly with someone who's going to come back again, um, at least one more time, Charles Wilson Peale. Now, to me, Charles Wilson Peale is a very interesting character in the story of American art because he's someone who, um, and this is, by the way, the Peale family, so his entire kind of extended family here from 1808. He's someone who... Um, really, really devoted himself to the arts, but he didn't have any natural inclination to the arts early in life. He just loved them. He was very devoted to the enlightenment, to learning. He thought that art was a way to cultivate learning, and we'll see that in his artistry. He started at, in, um, in after the, the revolution. He was actually someone who served under George Washington, uh, in the revolution, he started as a craftsman, as a clocksmith, as a silversmith, even as a saddler making uh, uh, horses saddles. He is from Maryland, by the way. Uh, he also painted signs. And then he decided, hey, I'm going to go see if I can become a painter. He um, copied works by other artists early in his career, Copley, Smybert, uh, Hesalius, another famous painter that I'm not showing you. But in 1767, so before the uh, revolution, he went to London to study under Benjamin West for a little over a year. Uh, he focused at that stage on miniatures because it's the only way he could make money. And then he went on to try his hand at larger paintings. He ended up making friends with a businessman, Edmund Jennings, uh, who had huge connections in London uh, and in, um, in Maryland and in, frankly, New England, uh, who introduced him to the upper crust of these areas and allowed him to make these connections so that by the end of his career, he had painted over 200 big portraits of these people and made decent amounts of money. In this portrait of his family, I just want to point out some things that he's doing here. Um, these are, if you just follow my a cursor. These are his family, of course, and we've got a conversation piece again, people interacting with one another, primarily through the use of implied lines. You know, she looks over here, so we look over there. He looks down at a sketch. The child looks out at us with the women looking out at us to bring us into the scene, right? So it draws all these figures together. They're all dressed in, again, uh, let's say subdued, but in clothing that shows you that they have some material wealth, thus they have you know, made something of themselves in the world and God is shining upon them. The artist is painting himself in a self-portrait here, drawing, right? Drawing in the classical tradition is the beginning of all art forms. You see behind him a, uh, a symbol of harmonious concord of three women kind of in uh, in a circle holding together. This is showing you harmony, which is mimicked by the composition of these uh, of the family itself. Uh, he's also trying to show off his skill at artistry. Um, not only is he drawing, not only is this obviously a painting, not only are his family, all of his children, by the way, were named after um, famous artist. His son was Raphael. His other son was Rembrandt, Peel, and so forth. Uh, are learning the trade of painting over here. By the way, this is the underpainting of what will become a finished painting up above. He's also showing you his skill by showing you what's known in art as a still life, right? So fruits in the foreground, 
showing you can render those. He's This is very common in Dutch paintings of still lives. There's a knife sticking off the table. That's a what we call foreshortening, something that's pointing towards you in a painting. In order to paint that, it's really hard to do, right? If I ask you to paint my arm out to the side, it's pretty easy, but if it's painting, uh, pointing towards you, it's hard. So he's showing you his skill here. It does the same thing by draping the fabric off the edge of the table. Uh, he paints a dog in there to show he knows how to paint animals. The fruits, of course, are associated with the women off to the side for reasons we've already talked about. And then up here in a painting technique called grisaille or painting in gray tones, he paints portrait busts of here himself. Uh, here, Benjamin West, who has trained him, and in the background, his patron, uh, Edmund Jennings, who has gotten him all the connections. Again, Peel's primary job, especially early in his career, as he's making money for himself, is to paint portraits. This is what almost everyone wants. They don't want other kinds of art forms. And this is Edward Lloyd family. Edmund Jennings had introduced him to the upper crust merchants in Maryland and Philadelphia, and uh, uh, Edward Lloyd is one of them. Um, he's a fourth generation plantation owner, rich planter. Uh, he's wearing, of course, imported rich clothes, uh, as is his child and his wife. Behind him, again, he's standing, right? But behind him is the Y House. That's W-Y-E. Uh, it's a very famous early uh, building that he owns, showing his wealth and his prosperity and his standing in society. While his wife, of course, is seated, uh, seated again in a Chippendale sofa, so a very important, very stylish, very expensive imported sofa, uh, from Europe, and she's playing a musical interest known as a cytern, um, which is kind of like a, a, a mini um, uh, guitar or something like that. And why? To show her cultivation, to show that she's been cultured. She has her musical skill here, right? There's a rhyming of the woman with the child who's placed in closer proximity to her and the child holding mother's hands. After all, her primary role is to produce those children. So it's all encoded in these works of art. And then you can probably tell, while there is nature behind him, the majority of nature is behind her. As I said, and you'll see many of these portraits, I just want to kind of make this stand out. He served under George Washington. So in this portrait of George Washington, not as uh, you know, the major general yet, but as the colonel of the Virginia regiment where he started working with him, uh, this is painted before the, the revolution in 1772 and gives you kind of a sense of this man before he became the big figure that he was later on. But I'll come back to his portraits of him later. He also painted uh, portraits of very important figures at this time, in particular, uh, Benjamin Franklin that you see here. So Benjamin Franklin is a little bit different character than most of the people that we've seen so far. He was a hard and fast enlightenment man. He believed in science, in uh, testing theories, right, in rationality. He was religious, but he was what was known as a deist, D-E-I-S-T, meaning that he believed that God inhered in all things and was ultimately knowable through rational um, investigation. So um, Benjamin Franklin, of course, was uh, very industrious in his own life. He performed many scientific experiments, and you see the major one here. This is not a very convincing, but it is supposed to be lightning in the background here in the window while he's sitting writing uh, one of his uh, many, many uh, treatises. I, 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 this is the place that I think uh, it's important to kind of give you a sense of some of the things that that uh, Benjamin Franklin said that, that correspond to some of the ideas we've been talking about so far. In 1748, in a famous treatise called The Way to Wealth, Benjamin Franklin declared that, quote, without industry and frugality, nothing will do, and with them everything. He that gets all that he can by honesty and saves all that he gets, necessary expenses ex uh, accepted, will certainly become rich, if that being who governs the world, meaning God, to whom all should look for a blessing on their honest 
endeavors doth not in his wise providence otherwise determine. Does that not sound like Calvinism to you? It's now shot through to even very, very secular philosophies. This work itself was commissioned by the American Philosophical Society. So you, uh, of course, see that lightning in the background. It's actually hitting a lightning rod. Um, he is writing on the, uh, you know, in front of him on that paper, uh, his treatise called Experiments and Observations on Electricity, which you can actually read in the original paintings. Of course, there are various symbols of prosperity throughout, including the silver uh, inkwell uh, and his clothing. I also want to say this, and this will come up again in the future. Benjamin Franklin, like many of his age, uh, understood that artists seeking to import some of the glamorous, very classically inspired styles of Europe were going to have a hard time doing it uh, because America was just too locked on pragmatic concerns. And so as we, as I kind of foreshadow next week's lectures, what I want to do is give you this quote on Benjamin Franklin, um, where he said, uh, replying to a European friend asking about pro possible employment as a sculptor, he said, quote, I hardly think it's worth his while to, uh, at present to go to America in expectation of being employed there. Private persons are not rich enough to encourage sufficiently the fine arts, and the public being burdened by the war debts will certainly think of paying them before it goes into the expense of marble monuments. In other words, it's not important enough for Americans to do. It's not going to get support. Why would artists come here at that time? So then just because it's a, a break from portraiture, I wanted to tell you that um, Charles Wilson Peale was also a very much an enlightenment man himself. By mid-career, he ben begins kind of splitting his time between creating paintings and portraits and trying to establish one of the first natural history museums in the United States, um, which becomes the Pennsylvania Academy to the Fine Arts. Um, and in, of course, trying to build this natural history museum, he is doing things that are early archaeological investigations. What you're looking at here is his painting called Exhuming the Mastodon. For those of you who don't know, a mastodon is basically North American version of a woolly mammoth, and he found an entire skeleton of this, which was the pride and joy of his museum. So you see, again, him trying to pull water out of this digging ditch during a storm uh, in order to find this mastodon. Uh, skeleton that will later on become part of this museum, which we see here. This was his crowning jewel of his life. This is his work called The Artist in the Museum from 1822, one of his, his final major paintings. And what we see is Charles Wilson Peale, his self-portrait, lifting up that very Baroque, very theatrical curtain to show us um, this natural history museum, um, what again eventually becomes the Pen Pennsylvania uh, uh, Academy of the Fine Arts and Pennsylvania, um, well, later on it'll become the Philadelphia Museum of Art. At this point, being a natural history museum, it's more of a cabinet of curiosities, as they used to say in early museums. It's, it's part natural history museum, part fine arts museum, part um, kind of just odd things that he's come across, all put into the same space. The primary thing that you see here are all these shadow boxes. They're little shallow boxes in which he has placed all of the taxidermied birds from James Audubon's uh, famous, uh, you know, John James Audubon's famous um, uh, prints of birds that he is producing. You see all those all those beautiful prints that you have from John James Audubon, the way that he painted those, and we're not going to go into this in this class, is that he would, for the most part, shoot the bird, taxidermy the bird, wire it up into various poses, and then paint the picture from those taxidermied birds. When those taxidermy birds needed a place to land, so to speak, uh, Charles Wilson Peale put them in his museum. Across the top of that, you may be able to see this, are hundreds of his own portraits of notables uh, in uh, his communities in Pennsylvania and Boston. 
uh, in Virginia, by the way. And then behind him, off to this side, you see, and he's not going to show you this because he wants you to come to the museum, that skeleton of the mastodon, which he has exhumed. But you see some big partial bones here in the foreground. And then, I just find this hilarious, um, at this time, I don't think we had quite determined that our national bird was going to be the bald eagle. And of course, the bird that actually allowed us to subsist in North America early on, the one that we used as a major food source, was the wild turkey. So you see a wild turkey here in the foreground. He was like the second choice for um, you know, our national bird. That would have been hilarious, right? Uh, a turkey um, behind uh, Donald Trump right now, you know, ruling the universe. But this turkey, and if you've ever been around turkeys, you know they're not poultry, not quite the smartest bird in the world, is pecking at a box of tools. Those tools ha happen to be taxidermying tools. So, you know, he's pecking at the tools that will eventually be used to turn him into a stuffed bird. In the museum itself, if I get in here closer for you, you see who he is trying to uh, inspire. A woman uh, on her own, which wouldn't have been the case in Europe, who's got her hair covered again because she's out in public, who is showing emotion in response to the Mastodon. Oh my goodness, look at the Mastodon. Associating women with emotion is very common. Behind her is a man showing his kid and teaching his kid about the birds of America. And then you also see a contemplative, again, not the same kind of emotional response of a woman, man, observing this uh, you know, museum as well. Here's just kind of turning on the light so you can see a better sense of what this earliest of museums in United States looked like. Well, that's it for our lecture on uh, colonial portraiture. Um, and uh, again, you're going to have a summary essay on uh, the freak portraits uh, in relation to Calvinism. You're basically going to be asked to write in about three pages. You know, it can be from two and a half to let's say three and a half, four pages. Uh, a summary of the ways that Calvinist ideas find their way into the visual form of those portraits. All right. Well, until next time, thanks for listening.